Hello, my name is Brandon and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. If you are new to the channel, welcome, it is great to have you. If you are a returning viewer, it is great to have you back. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with classmates, colleagues, or friends, or anyone else you think might benefit from watching. So now that we are introduced, let's go ahead and get started. So this video is the next in our series on descriptive statistics and it is about the geometric mean and standard deviation. Now, in my experience, the geometric mean is often skipped over in many stats classes, and I think that is very unfortunate for several reasons. One, it's actually pretty cool and interesting. There are some insights we're gonna learn about as we go. But also, it is extremely useful, especially in business when you're dealing with rates of return on investments or other types of financial instruments. But it's also useful in other disciplines like biology, medicine, agriculture, or in any other discipline where you're dealing with growth rates over periods of time. So let's go ahead and learn about the geometric mean and standard deviation. So let's start with what I call some geometric insight. So here on the left, we have a perfect square. So the square has sides of four, so the area inside the square is just four times four or 16. What if we want to know the average length of each side. So in this case, we're dealing with the two sides to find the area. So four plus four equals eight. Then we take eight divided by two, that gives us four. And of course, four squared equals 16. We get our original area of 16 units back. However, what if we're not dealing with a perfect square? Let's say we have a rectangle like we have here. So one of the sides is 1.3 units. The other side is 2.9 units. So that gives us an area of 3.77. What about the average length of the sides? So we take the average of those sides, we get 2.1. Now to find the area, we square 2.1 and we get 4.41. So now we have an area of a perfect square that is 4.41 when we use the average side lengths. However, that is not the same as the original rectangle. The area of that was 3.77 over here in the middle, but on the right, when we use the average side lengths, we get a perfect square of 4.41 units. So what's going on? So here's our perfect square again. So again, four times four is 16. In this case, what we're gonna do is multiply them together to find the area, but instead of dividing that, we're gonna take the square root of that product. So four times four is 16. The square root of 16 equals four. Now what about our rectangle that we had? So here we have 1.3 times 2.9. So the area inside this rectangle is 3.77. So now let's do the same thing. 2.9 times 1.3, that gives us 3.77. We take the square root. We don't divide by two. We take the square root of 3.77 we get a value of 1.94165. Now, if we create a perfect square with sides of 1.94165, now we get the area we expect a 3.77. So what we are saying is that if we wanna create a perfect square of average side length that is the same area as the rectangle in the middle, we have to multiply those sides together, then take the square root not the average, the square root, to get that side length. Square it, and then we get the area in return. So let's take this to three dimensions. So here we have a three-dimensional box with sides of four, six, and nine. So four times six times nine equals 216. So the volume of this rectangle, this three-dimensional rectangle or box, is 216 units. Let's take four plus six plus nine equals 19. We take the average. So 19 divided by three is 6.33333. Now we multiply that times itself three times or 6.3333 cubed, and we get a volume of 254.037. That does not equal 216. So taking the average of all three sides, multiplying that by itself three times or cubing it, does not give us the same volume inside as we found using the actual three sides here on the left. 
So now let's do the same thing. Here is our original three dimensional box of size four, six, and nine. Four times six times nine equals 16. That's the volume inside this box. So now what we're gonna do is take the product of those three sides and then take the cubed root of that product because we're dealing with three sides or three dimensions. So the cube root of 216 equals six. Now if we take that six and create a perfect three dimensional cube, so six times six times six, what we get is a volume of 216. So what we have done is taken the average of the three sides in the left box to create a perfect cube over here on the right. So all three sides are the same, they're identical, the perfect cube, and we get the same volume in return that we had over here on the left. So here is the formula for the geometric mean, and it's not anything complicated or scary because we just did it on the previous four slides. So the geometric mean, which is X bar sub G, remember X bar is our mean, sub G means geometric. It's simply the nth root of n values multiplied together. So the product of n values. Now over here on the right, we just have the exponential notation for root. So remember we can rewrite, for example, the square root as something to the one half power or 0.5 power. So we take a number like 16, we have the square root of 16 it goes four, but also 16 to the power of one half or 0.5 also equals four a different way of writing root using exponents. So let's use the geometric mean in a real world problem. The geometric mean is often used in business and finance because finance and business deal with a lot of rates of return or growth over periods of time. Now it's not limited to financial applications. Like I said at the beginning, any discipline that uses growth rates can use the geometric mean, biology, medicine, agriculture, what have you. But in this case, since finance is the most often used application, we'll use something along those lines. So here we have $1,000, and we're gonna look at its change over periods of time. We're gonna track its percentage change and what's called its growth factor, which is just a different way of saying percentage. So over this first period, we had a percentage change of 5%. That is the same thing as a growth factor of 1.05. So keep in mind that a growth factor of one would mean that our investment did not grow at all. It remained the same. We didn't gain anything. We didn't lose anything. So a 5% change is a growth factor of 1.05. We just take one plus 0 0.05, which is 5%. So now we have $1,050. And of course, that is based off our original investment from where we started. Now in the second period, we have a percentage change of 2%. So that equates to a growth factor of 1.02. So now we have $1,071. And of course that is based off our previous value of $1,050. It is not based upon our original investment. We're going back to the previous period. The previous period is where we start in this case to get to our $1,071. And let's say the next period, unfortunately we lose 3%. That equates to a growth factor of 0.97. And you can see how this works. We're just taking one minus 0.03. That relates to a growth factor of 0.97. And this is important to convert to a growth factor because the geometric mean can only use positive values. So now our investment is worth $1,038.87. And again, that 3% loss is referring back to our previous balance of $1,071. So our $1,000 investment changed to $1,038.87. So that relates to a growth rate of 3.887%. Now what we often ask ourselves is, what is the average growth rate over those periods of time? Now what we could do is take the average of those growth factors. So 1.05 plus 1.02, plus 0 0.97, and then we divide that by three, that's 3.04 divided by three, that equates to an average growth factor of 1.01333, or percentage average growth of 1.333. However, when we go ahead and do the math with that, we have 1,000 times 1.01333 to the third power, because we're doing it over three periods, we have a value of $1,040.53. 
That is not what we calculated above. So what did we do wrong? So we'll start here. Then now this time we're going to do it the proper way. Now we will multiply our growth factors together and then take in this case, the cubed root, because we have three periods. So 1.05 times 1.02 times 0.97. We take the cube root of that product. We end up with 1.0128, which is 1.28%. Now when we take our $1,000 and we multiply that by 1.0128 cubed because of our three periods, now we get the correct value of $1,038.87. And that is how and why we use the geometric mean when using growth rates. If we use the arithmetic mean that we're typically used to, we're going to get a wrong answer because growth rates are dependent on multiplication, not addition. Now, one thing you might've heard of is this concept called Kager. In my day job, we actually use the term Kager all the time to track our growth rates over periods of time. In this case, Kager stands for compound annual growth rate. So you could take your growth rate each year based on the previous year and then use the geometric mean to find the average growth over that period of time, in this case, annually. Now, not to go too far into the weeds on this, but there is a way to use natural logarithms, and some of you may have thought of this already, when doing the geometric mean. So here is our geometric mean formula. Now what we could do is take the natural log of each side. So on the left-hand side with the natural log of our geometric mean equals the natural log of each of our values, we sum those up and then divide by the number of observations we have. So in our case, we had the geometric mean using our growth rates, looked like this, but we could take the natural log of that geometric mean, so the natural log of 1.05 plus natural log of 1.02 plus natural log of 0.97, add those up, divide by three, then we get the natural log of the geometric mean equals 0.0127112. Now we don't want natural log there on the left, so we have to think algebraically what is the inverse of natural log. And of course that is using E. So we take E, raise it to that power on both sides, and then we go ahead and do that out. We end up with a geometric mean of 1.0128, which is exactly what we calculated using the geometric mean in the previous slide. So again, the natural logarithm method is just a different way of doing the same type of problem. And actually we can quickly verify this using our three dimensional box. So we have four, six, and nine as our sides. We can go into Excel or whatever else. We take our three lengths, four, six, nine, take the natural log of each of those lengths. Then we can find the average of those three lengths. Then we can find the average of those three lengths and we have 1.791759469. And then what we can do is take E and raise it to that power. So if you see here in the lower right, the EXP function in Excel is E. So we take E raised to the power of 1.791759469, and then we get the value of six, which is the exact same thing we found out before when we wanted to create a cube that is uniform length on each side of six, six, and six. So finally, we have the geometric standard deviation, and it's not that bad. On the left-hand side, we have the natural log of the geometric standard deviation equals the square root of the sum of the squared deviations. So the natural log xi, which is the natural log of each observation, minus the natural log of the geometric mean. We square those differences, sum them up, and then divide by the number of observations we have in, and then take the square root. So yes, I admit that was a mouthful, but let's see what this looks like in our example using our financial data. So underneath the square root sign, we can see what's going on here. So our first growth factor was 1.05. Our geometric mean was 1.0128. So natural log of 1.05 minus natural log of 1.0128. We take that difference and square it, plus the next data value minus the geometric mean squared, et cetera, et cetera. So we go ahead and do all that math out, and then we end up with the natural log of the geometric standard deviation is 0 0.03274 which is 1.033282 or 3.3282%. 3 
So that is our geometric standard deviation using our financial data. Okay, so final points. The sample mean is only suitable for additive processes, of which this was not one. The geometric mean is suitable for multiplicative processes, so when we're multiplying things in sequence. All values for the geometric mean must be positive. That's why we used growth factors. While the geometric mean is often used in business for financial growth, investment performance, it is also useful for any measure that records growth. So in biology, we can think of the growth rates of maybe like bacteria. For agriculture, we can think of growth rates of crops, medicine, same thing for medical studies, etc. So any rate of change over sequential periods of any length is suitable. Now, while mathematically valid, unequal periods should not be used. We want to keep the periods standard, whether that's days, weeks, years, trials, or whatever. So we want to make sure that the measure of time between each period is uniform. Otherwise, the results, while you could do it math-wise, would be misleading. And of course, Microsoft Excel has the GeoMean function that will automate this math. And I'm sure Google Sheets has the same thing and other software programs have similar functions. So in Excel, you can actually put in your growth rates and then use the GeoMean function to go ahead and have it do the math properly for you. Okay, so that wraps up this video on the geometric mean and standard deviation. Like I said at the beginning, the geometric mean is often skipped over or neglected in many stats classes simply because of time. And I think that is extremely unfortunate and somewhat problematic. Many of the students I deal with here on YouTube or in my day job or what have you often go on to careers in finance, in business, in accounting, or even into other disciplines like medicine, biology, agriculture, etc., that all involve growth rates. And there are many other disciplines that involve growth rates as well. So think about it. If you are a finance professional and you have a series of growth rates and you're working with a client and you take those growth rates add them together and divide by the number of periods and tell that client, hey, this is the average growth rate. You are literally absolutely wrong. You are telling your client the wrong information. And that could cause serious problems both professionally and potentially legally. However, if you understand the geometric mean and standard deviation, you can give that client the proper information and the accurate information, which is obviously very important. So thank you very much for watching. I appreciate you spending some of your valuable time with me. I hope you learned something new and I look forward to seeing you again in our next video. Take care. Bye-bye.